welcome to Season 2, Episode 2 of the Scripture Study Project, a fresh and faithful study of the scriptures that we hope will renew your excitement for your own personal study and help you passionately teach what you're learning to others. We are back this week with um, Lesson 2, Episode 2, studying in Matthew 1 and Luke 1. Hopefully you had a great Sunday yesterday, the first two-hour block for all of us, right? Yeah, except me. Except for all of the sick people in this house. (laughs) We have been plagued with the flu this week, and it has not been very fun. And I was so sad I had to miss the first day of the new exciting two-hour church, but sometimes that happens. It was awesome. It was really, really awesome. So hopefully your Sunday was as good as our Sunday was. We even got in some good outside snow time, so... Good Sunday. Yeah, we're going to get started today with um, kind of an introduction to the gospel writers. I think this is an important thing. Um, And for me, a fun thing that I've kind of learned from you is just kind of understanding who these writers are and where they come from. So if I'm honest, when I heard that Come Follow Me was going to be moving through the life of Jesus chronologically instead of moving through the New Testament sequentially. So, for example, we're combining in this episode Matthew 1 and Luke 1. I was a little bit sad because um, while I, I love learning the details of Jesus' life in order, each of the four gospel writers has such a unique perspective and a unique view that to me, combining their words is kind of like taking, oh, saying, hey, in this general conference, four people talked on faith. Let's just combine all of their talks into one and and you lose some of that personality. So yeah. what we want to do is try and, this episode, explain the difference between the three synoptic writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John will introduce a little bit later when we get to his episode because he's kind of his own his own deal. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke often get uh, kind of lost together because a lot of what they write is so similar, Um, and yet there's some very distinct differences that they do on purpose because they're different people with different backgrounds and different purposes. And so this intro will hopefully help you navigate between the three. Um, Practically, it kind of helps you know where to go for certain stories. For example, you'll know that if you want a story about an event or a healing, that you go to Mark not Matthew, because Mark will probably treat it better and with more text. If you want something that has ties to the Old Testament or has scriptures involved with it, then you go to Matthew. If you want something that just sounds awesome, you go to Luke. So with that in mind, here are the three synoptic writers. The first gospel that most people think was written was actually not Matthew, it was Mark. Um, Mark, most people guess, was a scribe to Peter. And so even though it's called the Gospel of Mark, most people think that it's really Peter's gospel, that he either dictated it or that uh, Mark took notes from Peter um, and and uh, turned those notes into this, this gospel. Um, Mark Mark's gospel uh, emphasizes the doings of Jesus. It's very action-packed. And uh, Mark's writing to Gentiles. So Mark gives translations of phrases that we kind of get lost in in other other Gospels um, because he's trying to show that, or trying to to explain this Jesus of Nazareth, this Jewish Messiah, to a Gentile audience, to the wider world. Most people think that the reason why Matthew, Mark, and Luke have so many things in common is because Matthew and Luke actually... Uh, had Mark's gospel in front of them as they were writing. And largely, when it came to an event or something that happened, they would go to Mark's gospel and use what he wrote because Mark was writing for Peter. They would take Peter's apostolic uh, priority and they would take what Mark wrote and they would use that in their text. Now, they will change the order. Matthew will put things in a specific order and Luke will put things in a specific order. None of the gospel writers really made an effort to put things down in chronological order. And so you see stories that get shifted out of place or put next to other things, and that's on purpose. And we'll talk a lot about that as we go through the season. Um, Matthew, of course, is one of the disciples of the Savior. He's a Hebrew, and he's writing... Uh, to fellow Hebrews, writing to Jews, trying to convince them 
that the gospel should go to the Gentiles. So Mark's writing to the Gentiles. Matthew's writing to Jews, trying to convince them that the gospel should go to the Gentiles. Um, Luke, uh, most people think, was probably a convert from Paul. And uh, that his gospel, he even mentions at the beginning of his, that he's not an eyewitness to things. He didn't, he wasn't uh, a member of of Jesus' inner circle or, or wasn't a disciple of Jesus while he was alive. But he is an extremely polished writer. Um, and so he crafts this beautiful account that he's sending or expects to be sent to the whole world. Luke knows that this gospel that he's writing is going to be read by a very wide, very versatile audience. And so Luke often emphasizes that Jesus is the universal savior of all. And so that hopefully gives you an idea of who those three are. And we'll talk more about them as we study different aspects of their gospel. But that always helps me to kind of know who they are. And maybe, I don't know, over the years I've kind of grown a, a, an affinity or an appreciation for each individual gospel writer and kind of gotten to know them. This may sound cheesy, but kind of gotten to know them as friends almost and, and trust them a little bit more. Well, I think it does because even some of those things that <clears throat> you're explaining, it kind of explains why we go to Luke 2 for the story of his of Jesus' birth. He's writing it to to the world, mm -hmm. right? And just some of those things that I think if we're paying attention to some of those details, it really does make the text a little bit more rich to us. Yeah. So with that in mind, uh, we actually want to start with a story that I heard in General Conference a couple of years ago from Randall L. Ridd, who was a member of the Young Men's General Presidency. And I'm just going to paraphrase, but he tells the story of going to, uh, I think it was a high school reunion, and at this high school reunion, he has a friend that he learns uh, got joined the church when he was in his 20s. This is like his 30-year reunion or something. So they're all in their you know 50s. And uh, this friend joined the church in his 20s. And this friend turns to his group of friends and says, how come none of you ever told me about the church or gave me a Book of Mormon when we were in high school? The person sitting right next to him, another friend, turns to this converted friend and says, you could have had one of my copies. I got like 50 in high school. <laughs> I love that. I think that's so funny. <laughs> uh -huh. And what Elder or what Brother Ridd says is interesting is the person that converted to the church, he said in high school, I would have never expected him. He said he liked to party. Uh, he liked to cause trouble. He was the last person I would have expected to join the church. The person who never joined the church and got like 50 Book of Mormons, he was the one that we all had pegged to become a future great Mormon. And so he concludes, Brother Red concludes, that you just, you really can't tell who it is uh, that is ripe or ready for listening to the gospel and, and who isn't. Now that, of course, has kind of a missionary bent to it, but the underlying truth that I love in that story is that... Um, no matter what people look like or act like, that God has an independent and an individual relationship with each of them. And sometimes it is the most unexpected, the most outside of the norm people that God works through to do the greatest things. Yeah. And of course, these people that we're studying to us are not ordinary, mm -hmm. right? We know the story. We know the ending of what they did. But if we place ourselves into their shoes, into Mary's, into Joseph's, into Zacharias and Elizabeth, they are very ordinary people that feel like they're called to something grand and maybe overwhelming even. Mm -hmm. Well, for sure overwhelming. We see that in some of this. Um, I'm going to be referencing a couple times this, um, this article from this month's Enzyme. So January 2019. It's written by Gay Strathern. I would... Who I am a huge <laughs> fan of. We really love her. Zach was able to take a few classes from her while at BYU. And she... Everything she writes is just brilliant and mm -hmm. teaches too. Um, so I would highly recommend that. We will put it in our show notes for you to, to read or just open your Enzyme. But I want to read this from her. She tells something similar in her in her article here. She says... The story of Mary reminds us that God is aware of all his children and that he calls ordinary men and women to participate in extraordinary ways to help build his kingdom. And isn't that, I, I really just like that shift of really thinking like, wait, what was it like for these people when this happened? And realizing that they felt just as ordinary as you and I feel when we're called to do whatever it is. And these writers, Matthew and Luke, are making a specific effort to show 
um, how how unexpected this story of Jesus is in every aspect. So even though Mary and Joseph sound, I mean, they're household names to us and we know them and we revere them, uh, they were very unexpected guardians slash parents for the Messiah. And so what we want to do is focus on these individuals from Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 1 that are kind of these unexpected disciples of Christ and see what we can learn from them. In fact, there's a, there's a couple of Ill, or diagrams in the Come Follow Me curriculum this week that are really neat on uh, what is, for example, one's what, what does the angel say to Mary and what messages do I think are in that message to me? Yes. And I think that applies, you know, they're specific to Mary in those diagrams, but I think that's really what this is about of like, how would I feel? How would I react to these things? Yeah. And though we're really excited about this study and talking about these, this is really just the beginning. These chapters are so rich. We really hope that this is just a beginning to maybe get things things running in your mind of what you can learn and teach this week. Um, because th these chapters are full of so much beauty in the scriptures. In fact, we were just talking about this. The hard thing about this podcast is I have a very personal passion for the New Testament and uh, it's such a dense book. There's so much packed into individual verses. These writers made uh, made really deliberate choices with almost every single verse and line that they packed in there. And so there's a lot to go through, and we're just going to get you started, and then the rest will be up to you. So yeah, it'll be a, it'll be a great study. These these are just great chapters. Okay, I'm going to start in the book of Matthew. And Matthew does a couple of things. As we mentioned, Matthew's Jewish, and he's writing to a Jewish audience. He's writing about the time, either right before or right after, but in the middle of this discussion, Jesus, in fact, Matthew's the one that tells us this, at the end of Matthew, Jesus says to his disciples, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, which is unexpected. The entire history of the Bible, the Old Testament, is all about how God's chosen people should not associate with outsiders. They come up with a name. They call them Gentiles, which literally means outsiders, foreigners. And here Jesus is telling them, break down those walls. I want you to go everywhere and tell everyone about all of this. The problem is that's such a new idea that it takes them a long time uh, to get started on that. There's a huge debate over it. And there's arguing and there's problems. A lot of what Paul writes later on is written to kind of that argument. And so Matthew's probably writing into that environment. He's trying to write to Jewish converts, so Jewish Christians, to convince them, no, Jesus really meant what he said. This unexpected challenge from him to go into all the world really is uh, a commandment. We really should be following this. And so the way that he starts his gospel, we skip over the first 17 verses, which is the genealogy. But there's some really interesting things in here that Matthew is trying to do to show us that, yes, God does work through unexpected ways. And yes, you are expected to do unexpected things. So first of all, this, uh, in Matthew, there are five women that Matthew mentions in his genealogy, which in a patriarchal society, like it was, is extremely unexpected. Um, some of those women are even more surprising because of their background. For example, uh, Tamar, mentioned in verse 3, was a prostitute. And if you go and read the Old Testament story of Tamar, it's just ugly. Ruth, mentioned in verse 5, is a Moabitess, so she's not an Israelite. And then in verse 6, uh, she's not named by name, but she's named by reference, Bathsheba, the one that, that David kills her husband and, and has a child by her. That's the lineage that Matthew points to, these five women who in some way, all of them are outsiders, so that right at the beginning, he's going for the shock value so that you see, whoa, this Jesus is an unexpected Messiah. Even though he is, and Matthew makes this point over and over, the very fulfillment of every Old Testament prophecy, he is also not the Messiah that we that uh, everyone expected him to be. He is so much more and so much different. And so I really like that um, to kind of remind us that sometimes unexpected things happen to us and it happens by God's design. The next unexpected thing that happens, and this one's perhaps more important, uh, is the description and the mention of Joseph as this mortal male guardian of Jesus. Um, this comes from the Gospel of John, but there's that verse 
where I think it's it's uh, Nathaniel that asks, is there any good thing that comes out of Nazareth? Joseph comes from Nazareth, and uh, the geography of the day, all the important things in the kingdom happened in Jerusalem. We always talk about a little town of Bethlehem, but Bethlehem was a very famous city. It's the home place of David the king. And so that southern area, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, all of that, very, very important. Nazareth is up in the north. It's by the Sea of Galilee. These are your farmers. These are your outsiders. These are your quote-unquote rural bumpkins. And here Matthew is saying that the 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 husband of Mary, the the adopted father of Jesus, is this Joseph who nobody knows and no one will know. And there's not even a whole lot of mention of him in the scriptures. And yet here he is being this this father of Jesus. And one thing I really like about this is um, I think there is something that Jesus learns from Joseph that I think we learn or can learn from Joseph as well. So you know the story. Uh, Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant. And verse 19, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Meaning he's not going to name her sin, which he assumes is adultery. She's pregnant and not by him, and so that's the only assumption he can make. Um, the consequence for adultery is being stoned to death. It's very strict law. And uh, there's some Bible commentators that say Joseph could have even been in trouble for not exposing her sin. At any rate, Joseph chooses mercy, he chooses leniency, he chooses love over anything else. Now, of course, he'll hear from an angel and everything uh, will be explained to him. But that moment where Joseph chooses to look at this, this Mary, this outsider, this young girl, and look at her with mercy and love, I think belies maybe something in his character. If Jesus spends his childhood growing up in a home that's run by a man who views outsiders, maybe because he himself is one, but views outsiders with love and mercy and understanding, is it any wonder then that Jesus, when faced with something similar, when the scribes and the Pharisees throw down in front of him this woman taken in adultery, that Jesus himself chooses love, mercy, and leniency. I love that idea, and I love that it teaches me uh, and maybe changes the way that I view outsiders. I love this story. You know, he's, you mentioned the dream. Mm -hmm. And then in verse 24, simply stated, then Joseph being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. So not only that was an angel appeared to him and he didn't, it was in a dream. It doesn't, I mean, we don't know. Maybe there were questions he had, but it was simply... He was going to do it. He believed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really powerful too. Simple man, simple faith. Mm -hmm. I like that. And now as we move into studying in Luke, we're going to start first with Mary and think again about where she was and what she was feeling. Um, she was just ordinary. She was being called to something great, but certainly didn't feel comfortable in, in what she was hearing. Um, even though the angel was telling her how highly favored she was and that she's found favor with God. I'm sure that was that was necessary for what he was about to tell her was going to mm -hmm. happen. Um, and Sister Strathern points out that calls of discipleship often require alterations to our personal life plans and can be uncomfortable. But when we ask questions, that that will help us move out of our comfort zone and raise the bar for ourselves as we figure out what God wants us to do or to be. And that's what we see Mary doing. She asks the obvious question of how is this going to happen? And, and she gets some answers. And I feel like she even gets a little bit further guidance that that question brings, this is how it's going to happen, but also go and see Elizabeth. Hmm. I really like that thought that these questions that she has brings greater understanding and someone that can help her through this. That's a good point. I, we, with, in seminary, we're studying the Doctrine and Covenants. And one of the things just to tie in is, mm -hmm. um, as the saints in church history are, are trying to find the location or trying to, they want to know the location of Zion, where this future city of Zion will be. 
uh, the Lord gives them a couple of revelations before he actually gives them the revelation where he states the center place of Zion. And these earlier revelations just give them stepping stones. Go here, do this, hold a conference there. And it seems to be something very similar where um, sometimes the unexpected calls lead to necessary questions. And when we ask those questions, they may not get answered in an expected way, but in unexpected ways, go do this or go do that, mm -hmm. that then guides us down this path that God's leading us on. Because my guess is that that wouldn't be the first person Mary would think of, mm. but what a beautiful kinship they feel because of this and what great support they were for each other. I, as the story moves on, I mean, we can't skip over verse 38, um, one of the most beautiful verses. And Mary said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord. And handmaid has that, I'm, I'm here to serve you. I'm your servant. And it, that's just, that's just beautiful. Be it unto me according to thy word. And that's all she says. She accepts. She doesn't know more, but that's, she's going to do it. Um, and sometimes that's what it takes. We say yes to something and then maybe further, we are given further guidance. In fact, this is interesting. I think Sister Strathern points this out in that article, but the question that Mary asks, how shall this be, seeing that I know not a man, um, Luke places the story of Mary very deliberately next to the story of Zacharias and Elizabeth. Here's Zacharias, a very experienced, aged priest. He has a high position. He's a respected man. And the angel comes to him and tells him that his wife will bear child. And he asks a very similar question to Mary's, except his question is a, is a question of doubt. It's a question for a sign. It's a, this isn't, this isn't possible. Even though it's an angel telling him it, this isn't possible. And so, of course, he's struck dumb until the child is born. Mary responds differently. Even though she asks a similar question, she responds differently. That phrase, be it unto me according to thy word, is a very humble statement. Even the Greek, it's even more humble. And I've always wondered, um, when Jesus is in the grove and he prays that beautiful prayer, um, Father, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I've wondered, did Jesus, at least in part, just like he learned his, his mercy and his long suffering and his ability to look at others with, with um, love and compassion, possibly from Joseph, did he learn this humble submissiveness, at least in part, from Mary? Was he raised by a mother that in all things was able to say to God or to others, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. So I love that idea. Yeah, and further, we Sister Strathern here says, When Gabriel leaves, Mary is left alone. While it is one thing for a disciple to make declarations like hers in the presence of a divine messenger, what does she do now that the angel is gone? For me, that kind of was that thought of like, wow, I've had that certainly where I have felt very sure about something. And then later on, I think, did that really happen? Mm -hmm. Wait, am I crazy? What, what, what does this mean? And I think that puts us into perspective too of what Mary was feeling. And so as she took the angel's advice and moved and went to visit Elizabeth, certainly she was overcome. And I can just picture the tears coming to her as she had that second witness from Elizabeth um, in verse 42. And she spake out with a loud voice, this is Elizabeth, and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? You're getting emotional about this, even. Kind of unexpected, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> Why? Well, I think I'd never... I mean, the power of the scriptures, I guess, but I think I had never put put that together in that way and really felt the the aloneness that Mary was feeling in that moment of the angel did leave her, and now she was left to her own with a really big problem, mm -hmm. is what the world would see it as, mm -hmm. or her world and her culture and everyone around her, and and so... To her relief, I mean, what was it like for her even even making... It says she made haste into the city of Judah to find mm -hmm. Elizabeth. So maybe she, at this point she was like, I've got to find out if this 
if Elizabeth really knows. Mm -hmm. And so here she is just when she was saluted with Elizabeth, that just really hit my heart hard that what a beautiful, and I keep saying beautiful, but I, I need to think of some better words, but, um, nothing more, um, that second witness of your own <laughs> worries and your own, and your own what call. You, yeah. And your own discipleship that someone else sees what you're doing and knows that what you're doing is right. When you don't, we don't know what she was feeling at home, the persecution and the, the shunning that she was possibly getting. I think that's the doubt maybe that comes with unexpectedness. You know, how often when something unexpected happens to us, a, a prompting or a thought or a calling that we may not feel worthy of, or that we may not feel up to, how often does that fill us maybe initially with shock as it did with Mary, uh, but quite immediately with, with doubt or with stress or anxiety or worry. And here's Mary with all of those emotions and yet trusting in God, trusting in the message and following through with something she doesn't know the end of. What a great model for us and for our discipleship. And, and what a great model for the Savior as he goes throughout his ministry without knowing, um, you know, maybe what would happen and, and, and what the pains exactly would be. Yeah, and that Mary was his example and mother for a reason. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love you mentioned this, but I love... Mary's kind of psalm here at the end, and maybe this is a fitting way for us to close. Verse 46, Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. And then this, For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things and holy is his name, and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. My conviction, our conviction this week, is that unexpected things happen, not by accident, but by design. That's Matthew's point. That's Luke's point. Um, I think that's God's point that sometimes the most incredible things happen in unexpected ways to unexpected people. And so as you study this week, maybe you're searching your life for those unexpected moments for you or for your family. Maybe there's more that you find in these scriptures and more that you that the Spirit whispers to you. But at the very, we, at the very least, those unexpected moments and experiences can be testimonies uh, that you're loved by a God who knows you intimately, knows each of us intimately, and calls on us to do great and incredible things. We hope that you enjoy your study this week in these chapters. And again, we would love to hear from you in um, any form. <laughs> You're welcome to send us a voice message or send us an email or send us a dm on through our instagram page which is at the scripture study project and we would just love to hear what your experiences are if you're having um, maybe some successes or um, tips that you have that you'd like to share we would love to hear it and pass it on through this through our podcast so thank you for listening we hope that you have a wonderful week